أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم سيدنا محمد وعاله وأصحابه أجمعين برحمةك يا أرحم الراحمين All praise due to Allah the Lord cherisher nourisher sustainer and master of the universe the most gracious the most beneficent the most merciful Ya Allah it is only you that we worship and your guidance that we seek Ya Allah, keep us in a straight path. Ya Allah, show us the choice of blessings. Ya Allah, show us with your mercy. Ya Allah, guide us. Greetings, salam, salutations on our beloved Nabi Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's now 12 minutes past 7 on this Tuesday evening, the 2nd of September. Sorry, this Monday evening, the 2nd of September 2024. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to Business Matters on Radio Al-Ansar. My name is Faisal M.J. Suleiman and I'll be your host this evening, inshallah. We are discussing the complexities of power of attorneys in business and our very special guest today is a Johannesburg attorney, uh, and, and <clears throat> Nazneen Khan. Nazneen, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and jazakallah khair for joining me on the program this evening. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, wa alaikum salam. Nazneen, thank you for joining me on the program this evening. Uh, just to introduce our guest, uh, Nazan is an attorney. She practices as BP at BPG Incorporated. She's a notary. She's the co-founding di co director of Dignified Dispute Resolution. She's a board member of AMU, that's the African Institute for Underwater Research, Education and Exploration. She's currently working towards the solicitor's qualifying examinations in, of England and Wales in order to increase her knowledge and broaden her, her opportunities of work in common law jurisdiction environments. And she is somebody that I personally am very, very proud of. And she's done extremely well for herself. Nazni, congratulations. Well done. And thank you for joining me on the program this evening. Now, Nazni, as I said, our topic for discussion is the complexities of powers of, of powers of attorney in business. Let's start the discussion by just uh, telling us what is a power of attorney. Jazakallah so much for having me on the show, Uncle Faisal. And I have to say before I go into the powers of attorney, it's always nice listening to your show. It's always nice being here. And I don't know where you guys got that extensive bio from. It makes me a little uh, humble <laughs> because I don't read it often enough. Um, but yeah, Jazakallah so much for uh, for the sentiments and for the bio and the wonderful introduction. Um, just to talk about the challenges and the limitations of power of attorney and to explain to the public uh, what exactly, uh, you know, to introduce what powers of attorney are. I'm going to say firstly is that it's so important to at the offset explain this because there's a, there's a lot of people who do not understand what this is or rather they think they do, but they actually don't. Um, and it's surprising because many people get themselves into trouble for something like this and it's a scary thought because a power of attorney is an extremely important document and if uh, if not one of the most dangerous documents to give someone if you don't understand what you're doing or rather how to do it properly so in a general sense a power of attorney is a written legal uh, binding document whereby you're granting an authority or a mandate as we say uh, uh, in it uh, in attorney talk to a person to act on behalf of another person so you're giving them basically a power to perform actions on your behalf so um not in terms of necessarily a business if you're looking at just a general sense of people giving letters to other people to go and pick up their id book or go and pick up this that essentially is a power of attorney and it's a power you're granting to somebody else to perform actions on your behalf um, so the one being given the permission called the agent, the one giving the permission called the principal and the permission being given um, is uh, to, for the agent to act on behalf of the principal for something or uh, the company, as we'll discuss in today's talk. Mm -hmm. Just to remind our listeners that this is an interactive program and we have an expert as our guest this evening. If you have any questions on powers of attorney, please forward them to us via WhatsApp on 060 nine zero four one zero five six i repeat zero six zero nine zero four one zero five six now nasneen what are some common challenges that businesses face when implementing powers of attorney documents uh uncle basil i think the amazing Thing about this is that businesses are constantly facing not just one, not just two, but numerous challenges when it comes to something as simple but important as a power of attorney. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few. 
firstly, you know, powers of attorney that are drafted in a vague and ambiguous manner. I cannot stress enough how how um, how how much of consequence that is attached to powers of attorney that are dropped so vaguely and ambiguous. What this means is that the power of attorney is not drafted clear enough to understand what exactly the powers are granted to a particular person. And this then leaves the power of attorney open to dispute, abuse or unintentional irregular use of that power of attorney. So this usually becomes a problem, you know, when a holder of a particular office has certain duties of office to fulfill, and then unintentionally they use it outside the scope of what they're allowed to. For for example, you know, maybe um, someone holding an office where they need to sign a loan that they're not supposed to. This becomes problematic with contractual disputes because parties to the dispute, they start arguing whether the person signing had the capacity or the authority to sign on behalf of the company or not. And then this can obviously then lead to ambiguity about the scope of authority granted to that agent or that person that's holding the power. And this ambiguity can cause internal conflicts or disputes with third parties. Parties. For example, like, you know, um, as an attorney, I see numerous disputes on contractual claims where people have signed contracts on behalf of their company, and they're actually not allowed to sign those contracts on behalf of that company. They haven't been granted the power to do so. Um, then another challenge is the fact that businesses just lack proper understanding, I think, of the legal implications of this power in a sense that there's no training, there's no steps taken to help everyone in the business learn more about how this works because, um, you know, they, they think that the concept uh, is very simple. They think they already know this, but what this in turn does is it causes disputes in that relevant department or outside resulting in the agent, that is the person being given this power to perform actions, not within the scope of the uh, power of attorney and also not aligning to the values of the business or the objectives of their position. Uh, that's just two. And then another is that there's a large potential for the abuse of power of attorney, alternatively fraud. So if the power of attorney is drafted, for example, in a manner that is not specific enough, the resulting cause would be that the agent would in turn abuse this power of attorney by using it outside the scope of their duties, or in some cases fraudulently, um, to take personal loans, enter into agreements that they would not um, otherwise allow to, and then they bind the company to this. Um, just to 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 explain this a little bit more. There was a case where there was this lady who was appointed, she was granted the power of attorney to make payments on a, on a more smaller scale, so like petty cash payments. And mm -hmm. in effect, she actually fraudulent, fraudulently used this power to make personal payments on her behalf. And this was never checked. It was never balanced. There was no accountability. And it was only found out like two or three years later when it amounted to approximately two million. So, I mean, this this power of attorney, if it, it wasn't obviously drafted properly, so it granted her the authority to make all these payments, and then there was no checks and balances. Um, then another major challenge is that, uh, well, not a major challenge, it's more like uh, you need to basically learn the different jurisdictions and the relevant rules about power, how power of attorneys work, because obviously there's certain people granting power of attorneys to people in different countries to act on their behalf. For example, if someone's like in England and they're granting a power of attorney to people in South Africa, um, they obviously need to pay regard to the rules and regulations of that. And then there's the notarial thing that comes into effect with the authentication. So those are some of the challenges that companies would face because they need to, to in order to properly execute this power of attorney, they need to pay regard to those rules. Um, yeah. I think what you said <clears throat> is very important because, you know, we need to comply with all the formalities. Many of us just simply yeah. sign a power of attorney. They think they get it commissioned, you know, certified by commission of oaths is going to work. But as you said, if it's used in another country, then, you know, some countries ask that it needs to be notarized. Some ask that it be authenticated by the high courts, by the register yeah. of the high court. Some even ask that it be authenticated by their embassies or, or, exactly, or any, yeah. You know, locally, so one has to comply with all the formalities. Now, there's a question that's coming from one of the listeners, and the listener says that you spoke of companies giving powers of attorneys. Does a resolution taken by a by the board or taken by the by a meeting of the company authorizing a director or an agent to act on behalf of the company serve as a power of attorney to that particular agent? So we're not. Uh, yes. It <laughs> 
sorry we yes, uh, it is actually does yeah Yes, a resolution. So essentially it does, but what usually then happens in a company is a power of attorney, uh, in most cases, in order to provide like double protection, a power of attorney is usually, in other words, granted still um, by the by by virtue of that resolution. So the resolution would usually be taken in order to grant a power of attorney to some person to act on that on their behalf and then the power of attorney is then uh, drafted to grant them the powers and then to identify the scope because the resolution would ultimately just say that a power of attorney is being granted in this respect so the resolution might serve as a power of attorney but i think as a double measure you should take a resolution to be able to grant that power of attorney and then still draw a draft a properly defined power of attorney identifying the scopes the cross checks balances um, maybe the termination clauses and that sort of thing, which ultimately wouldn't be in your resolution. So how can businesses then ensure that the powers of attorney granted under a, under a power of attorney, or that the powers, sorry, granted under a power of attorney are clear and specific enough to avoid conflicts of misuse? Um, so I think, as I mentioned earlier, that businesses firstly need to take the time to gain knowledge on the implications of powers of attorney and consequently then learn how to properly draft them for each given purpose, because obviously different powers of attorney comes with the different challenges and comes with different clauses and that sort of thing that need to be in the power of attorney. So number one, they would have to understand the basic and important provisions that need to be included in order to avoid the ambiguity that I spoke about earlier on what is being granted to the agent. And this requires one to draft with precision. So you have to clearly be able to define the scope of power that this person will have. So for example, you will need to clearly set out exactly what actions they will be permitted to do and for what purpose. If the manager of a finance department, for example, in your business is being given the power to say hire employees under him or appoint auditors or accountants or pay them, this scope needs to then clearly define that they're able to sign contracts on behalf of the company and also define exactly what type of contracts, like for example, a contract of employment um, and for what these contracts are to be used in that department. Um, he cannot, for example, say sign contracts binding the company to an investment or a car purchase or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So that's just one. Um, two, what we can do is you can set limits for the power of attorney, which is also important. So sometimes you'll need to grant an authority to a person in a certain office that is on a lower, more ground level of the company, such as the scenario I spoke about earlier, which was somebody um, that was responsible for petty cash, such as the power to make payments on behalf of a company for small things. So you will need to maybe then set a monetary limit um, to ensure that that ground level employee is not authorizing payments for millions of rands, um, you know, and then and 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 you binding the company to millions of rands, you're spending millions of rands of the company's business on something that you maybe don't have the scope to do. So if you set that monetary limit a limit and you say that if under uh, if it's a hundred thousand rand and over a hundred thousand rand this needs to be checked by a third person that's something that a business can do to ensure that um you know it's specific enough uh another way that you can protect your business is maybe <sighs> Like I said earlier, it, it's a very complicated thing that seems very simple, but maybe consult with an attorney when drafting a power of attorney. Um, I think the important thing to remember is not to assume it's simple and you don't assume you know what you're doing. Have an attorney draft it or at the very least, have an attorney take a look at it to ensure that it adequately provides for the purpose of the power of attorney and still protects your business because that's ultimately what we want to do. We want to be able to have our employees or whoever is in that office perform their functions of their duties, but we also want to protect the business uh, at the end of the day. Um, then we can also, you know, regularly update or review the power of attorney granted, especially in the case of general power of attorneys, mm -hmm. um, where the time limit is not defined. So it's important to oversee how this power of attorney is being used and then review maybe the scope or the limitations and update them as they need be. In fact, <laughs> better yet, set a time limit for the power of attorney and on that period of ending, renew it as you see fit so that there's there's checks, there's balances, there's accountability. Um, and in fact, maybe another method of accountability could be that you have a protocol. Have this 
agent with this person being granted the power uh, uh, basically record every everything that they've signed, everything that they've done in the use of that power of attorney. And if something, and that needs to be checked, maybe weekly, maybe monthly. And if it's not in that record, it obviously falls outside of the scope of what they're supposed to do. So I think that's just some of the, the ways. Yeah, but you did mention somewhere along the line, general power of attorney. Now, what is the difference between a general power of attorney and a special power of attorney? So a general power of attorney is basically a power of attorney given in a general sense. And when I say this, what I mean is that um, you don't have a clearly defined period or a clearly defined uh, job that they're doing. If somebody is in a specific department of a company, they have a general power of attorney to perform all things within that company um, to perform their duty. So it doesn't define exactly what you're supposed to do. It's a more broader approach. For example, an attorney calls it a mandate. So in terms of the mandate, the mandate will basically say that we have the power to act on their behalf and represent them and do all things in our power power to, to issue summons and to recover a certain amount of money. So whether that means us issuing summons, whether that means us going to court, whether that means us speaking to other people on their, on their behalf, that's a very general sense. And it also doesn't really have a defined time. Whereas a special power of attorney is a power of attorney issued in respect of specific action. So if you're giving somebody a power of attorney, for example, to go and collect your ID book from the department, um, that is for a very specific action that you're doing, or you're granting somebody a power of attorney to maybe sign a contract on your behalf because you cannot make it to a specific meeting. So you take a resolution, uh, you grant a specific power of attorney or a special power of attorney, as we call it, for them to go there and all they need to do is sign that contract. So it's very, 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 very specific. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Another question has come through, and I'm glad this question came through because I was going to ask you that question as well. You know, you spoke of termination, etc. Now, what happens if I grant somebody a power of attorney and I die tomorrow? Is that power of attorney still valid? I think it really depends on the scope of that power of attorney and what your functions are. Um, a power of attorney ultimately comes to an end when uh, when a person dies. So if you forming a specific function and then you die, um, that power of attorney, you cannot act on behalf of a person because you actually have to have legal capacity in order to grant somebody legal capacity. But in a case where you're granting power of attorney for certain bank accounts and that sort of thing, and that power of attorney is granted, but then ultimately that also wouldn't really hold because then when you uh, are granted power of attorney for someone who's incapacitated, then there's a whole other legal process. So I would say that somebody needs to be very careful about um, following on that power of attorney if the person no longer exists. And it really depends on the scope of that power of attorney. Yeah, in fact, I think- And the purpose uh, of it. Absolutely. In fact, I think the general rule is that the power of attorney terminates upon death. Terminates upon, yeah. Terminates yeah. upon death. So that uh, if anybody wants to act after that, then they need to become an executor in the state. But, uh, correct, you know, having, correct. Said, yeah, having said that, uh, I think we need to take an ad break. But just to remind our listeners that uh, if you have any question on powers of attorneys, you can forward them to us via WhatsApp on 60 9041056. We're going to be visiting the marketplace now. So do stay with us. We'll continue after this, inshallah. You're listening to Business Matters on Radio Al Ansar with myself, Faisal MJ Suleiman, and Business Matters on Radio Al Ansar is brought to you by the Minara Chamber of Commerce. Our special guest this evening is Sister Nazneen Khan, who is an attorney practicing at BPG Incorporated in Johannesburg. And of course, we are discussing complexities of power of attorneys in business. Now, Nazneen, what legal limitations or requirements should businesses be aware of when drafting and ex or executing a power of attorney? Jazakala, um, thank you for welcoming me back. Uh, regarding your question, I think uh, I think I've already highlighted some of these, but to be more specific, um, we can start with the formal requirements um, because obviously at the beginning of the show we spoke about how important formal requirements are in executing power of attorneys. So a power of attorney must meet formal requirements under South African law, such as the fact that a power of attorney should always be in writing, it should be signed, and it should be witnessed. Uh, witnessed. In the case of companies, a properly regulated resolution taken, um, such as what we spoke about 
earlier um, that resolutions are very important, especially when you have uh, you have to be in a position to grant a power of attorney in order for you to give the power of attorney. So in South Africa, a power of attorney must generally be signed by the principal, the, that is the person granting the power, in front of witnesses and a resolution by directors or trustees um, to grant this power of attorney must properly be taken. So when I also say the resolution must be properly taken, obviously there are certain requirements in terms of the Companies Act um, that need to be followed in order for a, a proper resolution or a proper proper quorum to be called in order to take a resolution. And these must be signed, obviously, um, properly, in person, or, or whatever the requirements are for that particular resolution that needs to be taken. Uh, the other legal limitations that your businesses should be aware of is, as I said earlier, the document should be specific about the powers being granted to avoid overly broad uh, or vague language, which could lead to challenges or limitations in its enforcement. So it needs to clearly define what they're allowed, what they're not allowed to do, um, and that sort of thing, because I feel that's something that's very important to be able to uh, enable so a certain person to perform their functions, but also limit the, the ability uh, or limit the capacity of them to commit fraud or maybe negligently use that power of attorney, if we could say. <laughs> Let's not uh, directly accuse them of fraud. Some mm -hmm. people don't understand how to use a power of attorney because they th just think that they have this power to do whatever they need to do in terms of this power of attorney, but I think they need to be able to ident properly identify what their scope is. Mm -hmm. It's also important mm -hmm. to identify whether the principal has a legal capacity, like I said, to grant a power of attorney. Uh, as I mentioned, the resolution, alternatively, a position that allows them to grant the power of attorney in favor of the agent. So they must be of sound mind. They must be able to understand the implications of the document before they grant the power of attorney. And this is not just in terms of businesses. This is also in terms of what we spoke about before we went on the ad break. Um, that, you know, um, if a person is not of sound, uh, if a person is granting a power of attorney, a normal person and if they're unable to do something and that is why they're granting a power of attorney it's important to identify whether they're actually lucid or whether they have the capacity to understand the implications of the document which in effect like any contract would render it invalid uh, also you absolutely have to have a revocation clause. So you need to include clear terms on how the power of attorney can be revoked or terminated to prevent ongoing liability if the business relationship changes. So many people do not have this and it becomes a problem because mm -hmm. ambi ambiguity plus a lack of revocation clause can cause immense abuse of power of attorney. So say you grant a power of attorney to someone to make payments to the accountant. Maybe it was meant for a specific purpose and a specific account to service. This clause firstly opens the agent up to making payments of millions to the accountant for absolutely nothing. But uh, what I should say is the power of attorney granted by so-and-so to make a payment to the accountant who is named so-and-so for the services rendered on such and such a date to set up a trust or, or whatever the accountant did. So the authorization monetary amount, um, maybe that, as we spoke about the limitation earlier of the monetary amount, is say 20,000 Rand. It should not exceed 20,000 Rand without the authorization of a head of department. And then you need to include a lapse uh, once the payment is there. So you need to be able to include a lapse date or a revocation clause. Now, yeah. if, if we've forgotten the revocation clause, supposing it's not there, <laughs> Now, obviously, the principal, or, or rather, does the principal have the power to just unilaterally revoke that, that power of attorney at any time, if there's no revocation? Uh, uh, sorry, just repeat the question. You mentioned that we should ensure... A revocation, a revocation clause. clause. Now, if we've omitted that revocation clause, because many of us don't think of including the revocation clause, can, yes. uh, does the principal have the power... Of, to withdraw or to revoke that power of attorney at any point in time? Of course, because you act, mm -hmm. the person is acting on your behalf. So a so, person who grants a power to someone can revoke a, a, a power of attorney at any given point in time. And this is in a general sense, not in a business sense as well. In a business sense, obviously, uh, a resolution would uh, then need to be taken for everybody to consent that this, um, this power of attorney needs to be revoked. Um, there's no one person that can make a decision. So once again, a resolution would then be needed to needed to be taken. And obviously, 
that person cannot abuse uh, a power that is being given to them and they can revoke it at any given point in time. So even although the revocation clause you know, would be an added advantage with belts and braces, yes. even if it's omitted, I mean, it's not a chain smash because the principal can still still revoke that at his at his leisure because he's granted that particular power. Is that correct? That's one clarification. That is correct. But okay. um, what usually happens in terms of the protection of a revocation clause is the revocation clause would uh, provide for certain provisions on maybe the revocation. Like if a person has... Uh, uh, so maybe maybe the power of attorney was granted to one of the directors and the directors mm -hmm. obviously is also part of the resolution that needs to be taken. So the revocation clause would include under what criteria this power of attorney should be revoked. This would not cause dispute then among why this power of attorney should be revoked and it would ease the transition of that um, that uh, the resolution that needs to be taken because then there would be no doubt that this action was performed and the clause and this power of attorney needs to be revoked. Whereas, if you want to, you, if you want to re, you revoke a, a power of attorney and you uh, undertake to do a resolution, there might be some directors that might um, dispute the fact that this should be mm -hmm. revoked. So, I think mm -hmm. a revocation clause is very important to include. Thank you for the clarification. Now, can you discuss any recent changes in legislation or regulations that have impacted on the power of in the use of power of attorney in business context? Um, well, there has really been no major recent changes in South African legislation, specifically regarding power of attorneys, or at least none that I've heard of as yet. But businesses should always remain vigilant in any case about any updates in the Companies Act or the new regulatory guidelines that might affect the use of power of attorneys in their corporate governance. Additionally, you know, international businesses must be aware of changes in foreign jurisdictions, especially regarding electronic and digital, uh, digital power of attorneys, especially in light of these AI things that are happening. As many countries are adapting their laws to accommodate digital transactions and electronic signatures and that sort of thing. So what's just very important is to keep updated on what your duties are as directors, what your fiduciary duties in terms of the companies act when granting power of attorneys, how these affect your resolutions, um, how uh, legislation maybe changes in different countries for the authorizations in terms of the Hague conventions and how these are to be authenticated. Um, but this, as far as I understand, there's not been any recent changes specifically to, to powers of attorney that I know of. And how can businesses then protect themselves from potential abuse or fraud involving power of attorney, you know, the authority, authorization that they give for it? It's really all the things that I've already mentioned. You know, if people take into account, for example, constantly training your staff and yourself on how these are to be drafted, know what you're getting yourself into, define the scope properly, um, not vaguely, uh, have your termination clauses and your rev revocation clauses in, perhaps get an attorney to take a look at it, as I mentioned above, then you're steps closer to protecting yourself. And the other things that you can look at is choosing the right agent, that is the person you're giving the power to. Only select trustworthy people with strong track records. So this person should understand the business, be aligned with these values and goals. Don't just give a power of attorney um, to somebody who doesn't, maybe who's just come into the company and you don't trust him to do payments and that sort of thing, or maybe have it just very specific and not, um, not uh, grant them the permission to make payments until you absolutely trust them. Uh, then also, as mentioned earlier, you know, there's always important to implement the checks and balances in the process, like establish internal controls, such as requiring dual signatories uh, on high value transactions or regular reporting, like I said, the protocols by the agent, uh, which needs to be checked, which needs to be reviewed every week um, is preferable, but if not possible, then every month. So accountability is very, very, very important because ultimately your agent is acting in the capacity of the principal. And ultimately it's the principal that holds um, the fiduciary duty to act in the good cause of the business. So anything that your employees do, it falls on you to overcheck, to oversee. So if you're not doing that, then obviously the liability then falls on you as well. And also include, 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 include revocation clauses, as I keep mentioning, that are clear, that allow the business to revoke the power. Um, those need to define 
whether there's an abuse of power and whether uh, what specific actions revoke or automatically revoke, I would say, a power of attorney. Uh, in that case, you don't need to hold a resolution or you need to include your termination clauses, maybe. That's very important. I would think that, yeah, that's how businesses can definitely protect themselves. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question has come through from one of the listeners is that, are powers of attorney transferable? And I think what uh, the listener may, maybe want to clarify is that, I've been given a power of attorney to act on behalf of a principal, but I'm not available. I'm going away for a holiday tomorrow. Can I then transfer it to somebody else to act on my behalf, on the principal's behalf? I'm looking at a bit of a remote power of attorney. Is something like this possible? Now, whilst you're thinking of that, uh, Zach wants to take an ad break. We'll continue on the other side of this, inshallah. You're listening to Business Matters, brought to you by the Minala Chamber of Commerce and hosted by myself, Faisal M.J. Suleiman. Our topic for discussion is complexities of power of attorney in business. And our special guest this evening is Nazneen Khan, an attorney practicing at BPG Incorporated in Johannesburg. Uh, Nazneen, just prior to, the ad, uh, to, prior to the ad break, you know, a question that came in from a listener was, can or, or is a power of attorney transferable? And... Uh, the context is I've been given a power of attorney to act on behalf of somebody else. I'm going to be away. I want to now pass it on to someone to act on my behalf on that power of attorney. Is that possible? Unfortunately, not. A power of attorney is not transferable for the simple reason that um, you've been given permission or authority by somebody who trusts you to act as a representative of themselves. So this power of attorney has clearly defined you, has clearly defined your ID number, um, and has identified the principal um, themselves. So you, as a unilateral person, cannot appoint somebody else because that's not the wishes of the principle. The only time that an power of attorney is transferable is by the principle themselves, which for um, all intents and purposes, we spoke about earlier whether a power of attorney is uh, terminates on death of the, the principle. So yes, if a person passes away, obviously that power of attorney cannot be transferred because the principle has in effect passed away and they are the only ones that can transfer or appoint a new power of attorney. And I think uh, just to to drive this point a little more, it's something that, you know, uh, a power of attorney sometimes doesn't necessarily look like a power of attorney. There's many instances where we grant mm -hmm. people permission to do things on our behalves. That's yeah. actually a power of attorney that we don't, you know, ultimately identify at, at on the offset or on, at face value. For example, there's a common clause in any will that says that you're granting an executor that is now you're granting a power of attorney to someone to execute your estate after your death, right? That's mm -hmm. the only instance where you're granting a power of attorney to act as your agent um, and, and to do everything to wind up your estate. So in effect, you're granting this person a power of attorney. And then if this person is unable to perform the duties of a power of attorney, the person that's executing the will then appoints a second person who is able to act as the agent. So they say in the case of a person who is un in, in the case that they're unable to or do not want to act as the agent, then I appoint uh, a different person to to wind up my estate. Mm -hmm. So this has to be appointed by the principal. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> what are some best practices for businesses to regularly review and update their power of attorney documents to ensure that they remain effective and relevant? The protocols that I spoke about, uh, agents that hold a general power of attorney should have protocols of the list of how they use their power. So I think this is this is something that not everybody does, but I think it's very important for them to actually implement because it actually holds people accountable or holds a record of what they've done with their uh, with their um, power of attorney in order for the other person to be able to review it constantly and see whether this power of attorney is being used in its proper course. Um, so in saying this, I. Uh, I would uh, highlight that these should be reviewed, they should be overseen, they should be audited uh, as a double check, which is every week and, and every month. And as I keep mentioning before, is that directors or, or heads of departments have a fiduciary duty in terms of the Company Act to act in the good cause of business. And it's very important for you to double check what goes out because ultimately, you hold the liability for that. So also reviewing if the power of attorney needs to be changed or amended or, or altered to suit new rules, regulations, changes, and scope. 
So sometimes what happens is there's mergers, there's acquisitions of companies, there's a change in um, ownership, there's a change in management, and sometimes, you know, these policies changed. So it's always important to, uh, especially in relation to leadership, there may be instances where a person may not be able to have the power to hold uh, anymore due to company policy changes. So if there's a change in the way operations work, a person in a specific department may not necessarily need the scope of power that they hold. Uh, if for example, finances, if there's a whole different department set up to, to do finances, now the person in a different department might not necessarily need the scope of making payments anymore. So it's always important to review these changes, to review how the regulations within your firm or within your business changes, and then you need to adapt those power of attorneys and, um, and change them accordingly. Uh, it's also always important, like we said earlier, to keep abreast of legislation updates that may affect any power of attorneys, which obviously there's going to be lots of legislation coming into effect now, especially in terms of the AI, which hasn't hasn't actually come into being yet. There's many discussions, but there's going to be a lot of um, a lot of things that that are going to change. So I think, yeah, those are some of the best practices that a business would need to do to regularly review. Okay. I'm going to pick your brain a little now, if you don't mind. You did mention <laughs> earlier, <laughs> but I think that's what the is after. You've got to think on your feet. Uh, yeah. You did mention earlier that a person must be of sound mind and have legal capacity to execute a power of attorney. What happens uh -huh. if a person is suddenly incapacitated, you know, it just suddenly goes into a coma or gets sick or whatever, whatever, and is not in a position to appoint somebody to handle his affairs. How does one, what is the situation then? Uh, you're talking about if there's no power of attorney or anything granted no. in that respect. Absolutely. We've actually yeah. had situations like this. Uh, actually, a similar question was asked the other day where somebody wanted a power of attorney to act on someone's behalf who, in effect, is incapacitated and they weren't always mm -hmm. lucid. And my advice yes. to them was, um, obviously, a power of attorney is not going to work because if it, if that power of attorney is challenged, that person may not have been in the sign my a sound mind to able to mm -hmm. enable them to uh, to sign any agreement. Because as the law states, a person has to be in sound mind to be able to sign a power of attorney or to understand the consequences of what they're signing. Otherwise, it becomes null and void. So, in this circumstance, a power of attorney is not going to do. Uh, in this circumstance, there's an, a, a substantial application, uh, unfortunately, that needs to be brought in the high court that enables a person to be granted curatorship of this person and mm -hmm. able to handle their affairs. So in this affidavit, in the application, they would need to set out the circumstances. They would need to prove their circumstances from a psychiatrist or from their doctors, proper medical re uh, reports, and then only will the judge grant curatorship to either the person applying for curatorship or alternatively a different curator as the, the high court seems, deems fit because obviously you don't want um someone abusing uh the power of um of this curatorship to use the funds of somebody who's incapacitated um so, so yeah so there, there has to be uh, a proper proper made out case for that in order so, to grant uh, so the person probably going to use his entire all, all the funds he has in the estate to pay for the substantive application <laughs> Well, it can be brought on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. unfortunately, sometimes yeah. Uh, the law doesn't always provide justice. But this is something, this is an argument I was having with someone the other day. Because, I mean, if you need to do something in someone's account now, do you know how difficult it is to actually get a court date in in Pretoria and Johannesburg, I don't know Durban now, but in Pretoria or Johannesburg, there's multiple documents that you have to file and submit online in order to even get a date. And then sometimes, you know, with this court online system, it's difficult for them to see. And then you uh, you have to go in and you have to ask them for a date. So it's actually a little bit of a nightmare at the moment. But um, unfortunately, in order to provide adequate protection for this person that's incapacitated, a power of attorney is just not going to do because this person doesn't understand the consequences of granting that power of attorney before they grant it. So it's ultimately null and void. Yep. Nothing. I want to thank you for joining the program this evening. You know, undoubtedly it's been very educational. 
and uh, we've covered, I think, almost everything regarding power of attorney. But I'm sure you have a <laughs> message for our listeners. The message is basically everything I've spoken about, you know, um, we need to understand the different types of power of attorneys and the applications in business so that we can help our businesses navigate the legal complexities of delegation and authority. And we need to ensure that they are protected against potential risks um, while maintaining our operational efficiency. So I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, as a business owner, as a director who has the ultimate responsibility and liability for the continuity of your business and for um, the implications or consequences that arise thereof, you you need to you need to properly draft your power of attorneys. You need to uh, either get an attorney to check them up uh, at least for the time being and properly train your staff. So just learn, learn. Absolutely. Nelson Khan, thank you very much for joining me on the program this evening. And I wish you well. Uh, all the best to you. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as salam. Jazakallah for having me. Absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. We spoke to Nelson Khan, an attorney practicing at BPG Incorporated in Johannesburg. She spoke to us about powers of attorney. Time for me to bid you farewell. I want to thank uh, Zach. Uh, uh, Zach for having engineered for me in our studios. Zach, thank you very much for the job. Well done. And of course, I must thank Sister Farzana, from, oh, sorry, Sister Amina from Minara for having produced the show. Amina, thank you very much. Uh, most appreciated. And uh, thank you to the, to the Minara Chambers for giving me the opportunity of hosting this program. The next program you're going to be listening to Radio Ansar is Q&A with Mufti Abdul Qadir Hussain. And inshallah, that will take place immediately at 8 o'clock, inshallah, or inshallah. So, Till then for myself, Faisal M.J. Suleiman, all the best to you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.